Hello, uh, my name is Alex Cooley. I'm a professor here in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. Uh, I'm very interested in injury and illness at work and the recovery and return to work and long-term outcomes of people who are ill and injured and unable to work. And I'm going to take you on a rapid fire tour of some contemporary thinking and approaches to understanding work-related injury prevention and, and work disability management. Now we've only got 20 minutes, so this is going to be fairly high level. If you'd like any more detail on any of the things I talk about, please just get in contact with me. My email address is at the bottom of the screen here, or you can find me on the university website by searching my name. Here's a quick overview of the things I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to first of all just cover some terminology because it's quite important to think about what we mean when we use the term injury in a work context. Um, it's not as clear cut as one would like to think. And then I'm going to take you through a few topics uh, about where there are opportunities to prevent injury and disability arising from work-related conditions. Spend a bit of time talking about measurement and showing you some of the estimates of burden that we have. And then talk about the sort of proximal or immediate causes of injury and then what we'll call the social determinants of work-related disability as well. And then briefly talk about prevention, both primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. And we'll finish with just a, a few comments on what I'd call the weird and wonderful policy environment we have in Australia for, for managing um, and supporting people with work-related injury. So first of all, on terminology, um, we're talking about injury and this unit that you're focusing on is about injury. In a work context, that term is a pretty loaded term and it, it's quite confusing. So what I've got here is just some definitions in the blue box that are, are things that are sort of commonly used or consistent with terms that are commonly used in this sector. So three uh, terms I thought would be useful for us to talk about. One is work-related injury which is probably the term you thought we were going to use the most coming into this lecture. Um, but you can see the definition I've got here is physical injuries, psychological disorders, diseases, or even death that occurs in the course of work. So some of those things we wouldn't conventionally consider to be injuries. So we're talking about diseases as well. Then I have a definition of work-related disease, which is similarly is quite broad. It's acute recurring or chronic health problems caused or aggravated by work conditions or practices. And the acute there could refer to uh, traumatic injuries, uh, which I guess is a way that we sort of classically think of injuries. And then I have this concept called work disability. And the, the, the common definition of that is when a worker is unable to stay at work or return to work because of an injury or a disease. And all of this gets really mixed up um, uh, in the work injury field. There's a lot of overlap in how these concepts are used and defined. And that's reflected in the way that we as a society attempt to prevent and manage these injuries. And so the little symbol here is, it, is sort of an, an effort just to sort of describe that, um, that these things, this is complex. We're not talking just here about traumatic injury. We're really, what I wanna to talk to you about today is really the third concept is work disability. And so an illness or an injury that affects your ability to stay at work or return to work. Some of the specific examples I'll give you will be of work-related accident or injury because we've collected some data that way. But mostly I'm talking about work disability. And that's a slightly different concept to uh, the classical way that we think about injury. Now, here's an example of what I mean. Um, this is directly from the legislation of the workers' compensation scheme here in the, in the state of Victoria. It's the definition of injury. And you can read it yourself. I'll just cover this off a little bit. So under the legislation, unless it's inconsistent with the context or the subject matter, an injury means any physical or mental injury and also includes things like industrial deafness, a disease contracted by a worker in the course of that worker's employment, and a recurrent aggravation or acceleration, exacerbation or deterioration of any pre-existing injury or disease. So you can see it's a very broad concept. This term injury, as we define it here in Victoria, encompasses not just trauma, but also diseases, deafness, mental health conditions, and a range of other things. And that's 
typically what we see in real life when we talk about work-related injury, we're not just talking about trauma. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, here's a, a little bit more about what I mean when I say work disability. So you've already seen the start of this definition, when a worker is unable to stay at work or return to work because of an injury or disease. And, and then extending this a little bit, really what we, what we can say is that work disability may result um, from a range of different factors, things like physical or psychological factors to do with the worker, social or administrative or cultural reasons that mean that person is unable to stay at work or return to work. Worker may want to return to work, but feels incapable of returning to normal working life. So there's usually some sort of triggering incident, an accident or a disease that activates a period of absence from work. And then lots of other things come into play that influence whether that person can return to work or stay at work. Um, and so it's a complex um, phenomenon, really work disability. I'm gonna talk a bit about this. And, um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is opportunities for prevention of work disability. So if we, if we think about it in that more comprehensive way, it's not just trauma, but as something that influences whether someone is able to stay at work or return to work and has potential long-term consequences, then we can see multiple opportunities for prevention and management of people with work disability. And that's what this slide is intended to capture. So on the left, we've got when people are at work, they may be healthy and productive, and hopefully that's the state that most of us are in most of the time. And there we have an opportunity for primary prevention. So helping people remain healthy and productive and preventing yeah, workers yeah. from becoming ill or injured or unproductive. They're typically what we call primary prevention opportunities. Then some of us or most of us at some point in our working life will experience periods when we're ill or injured, and we may still be at work. And so we also have an opportunity there to help those workers when they're ill or injured return to health while retaining their employment and staying at work. And these are often called stay at work opportunities in the research that's done um, in this field and also in practice now that's making its way into employer land. Um, if people become ill or injured and then leave the workplace and they're, they're what we call work disabled for a period of time, that's when we start talking about return to work interventions. So helping those workers to return back to the workplace when they are work disabled. Uh, and then in Australia, when people are work disabled, they may receive benefits from one of a number of different compensation or healthcare or sick leave schemes. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And in some people, that period of work disability will become very long-term. And we know, because there's good evidence to show us, that long-term periods out of work can have pretty significant consequences for people who experience them. So um, things like poverty and homelessness, uh, um, long periods of disability, entering social welfare schemes, um, death, uh, suicide, um, or increased risks of suicide, and even intergenerational effects, long periods out of the workforce can flow on to um, generation, future generations. And so the fourth opportunity that we have here is to minimise those potentially negative long-term consequences. So when we're talking about work disability prevention, we're really saying that there's a range of opportunities across this spectrum of work disability to intervene and to prevent either the acute uh, impacts of an injury or an illness, or indeed the sort of medium and long-term consequences. Now I want to touch a, a bit on how we measure work disability and work injury. And the short story here is that there are many different sources of data that we can use to measure, um, measure these things in society. And I'll take you briefly through some of these. Um, one of the things that we use a lot, is, I'll call administrative data. So these are things like um, uh, workers' compensation claim records. So when a worker gets injured in Australia, they may be eligible to make a claim for workers' compensation. And we have this big network of insurance systems set up to support people uh, when they do that. And those insurers keep records of, um, of each of those injuries and conditions, and they can be quite detailed. We use that a lot in research. And a lot of the data we have at a national level in Australia on the prevalence uh, and consequences of work injury comes from these sorts of administrative data sources. 
but there are multiple other data sources as well, things like electronic health records. We see in some hospital admissions data or emergency data, it's possible to determine whether the reason the person turning up to hospital is because of work-related injury or accident. We have some regular surveys that are undertaken, for instance, by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Every three or four years, they run a work-related injury survey. We have another Commonwealth Government Agency which runs a return to work survey of injured workers every two years. And most of the state and territory occupational health and workers' compensation schemes also run some form of questionnaire or survey periodically. At an employer level, a lot of um, large and medium sized employers and most, even the most small employers will have some form of occupational health and safety monitoring system. It might be a basic injury and incident reporting system, or it might be something much more detailed and comprehensive. For instance, uh, the system we have here at Monash University is called SARA, Safety and Something. Uh, I can never remember what it stands for, but it's, a, it's an online um, system where if you're injured, you can, or if you're exposed to an event in the workplace, you're supposed to enter that into the software and it helps to monitor um, injuries and illnesses occurring in our workplace. Another source, um, but has been used in some studies of um, particularly suicide is coronial records. There are actually quite a few studies looking at um, suicides after work-related conditions. And then, of course, it's possible to link these data sources. And when you do that, you get uh, a lot more um, value because you can start to um, get data across multiple domains. And we're seeing emerging now over the last five or 10 years in the academic field anyway, and beginning to make its way into um, use by policymakers, some linked data sources as well. So lots of different ways that we measure work injury and work disability. There's a lot of jargon in this field, and here's just some other jargon that you might run into. And I just wanted to touch on two major concepts here. Um, first one is what we'll call lagging indicators of injury. Um, so these are things that occur at the point of injury or after injury has occurred. So these are typically most of the information and the data that we see and that is measured are lagging indicators. So things like the numbers of people being injured, the rates of injury, how long people are off work after they're injured, the costs of compensating those people, how, many, how much health service they're using, their return to work outcomes. Those are what we would typically call lagging indicators. Less commonly collected, but very important and increasingly important are what we'll call leading indicators or an easy way to think about this are things that put people at risk of injury and we can measure these things. They're important because they're things that may indicate a future risk and they also help us to understand whether programs or help us to understand how and why programs that we put in place to prevent injury might be successful or might not be successful. And these are things like the, or some, some concepts that are commonly talked about here are the quality of jobs, um, the relationships in the workplace, which are sometimes called things like safety culture or safety climate, um, incidents or near misses that might occur in the workplace, whether people are exposed to certain hazards, whether they be physical, psychological or biological hazards. And there have been over the last, particularly over the last five years, a range of measurement tools developed specifically to focus on these leading indicators. Now, as I mentioned briefly, the vast majority of the data that we collect routinely is lagging indicator data. So when we try to intervene, that can tell us if something has worked to prevent injury or to prevent the consequences of injury, but it can't really tell us why those things have worked. And so in developing leading indicator measures, what we're trying to do, or one of the things we're trying to do is help to understand why prevention works or doesn't work. Now, just to get into some of the estimates that we have on how common injury is and its consequences, there's a whole variety of data sources I mentioned previously, and not surprisingly, there are lots of different estimates. Um, there's probably no one true source of data here, so I'll give you a few so that you get a, you get a flavor for it. I guess the mess, key message to, um, to take from this is that it's a big problem. Um, and many, many millions of people around the world and hundreds of thousands in Australia are injured every year. So this is some estimates from the International Labour Organization. They have estimated on a number of occasions that there are about 
2.3 million work-related deaths annually. So that's people dying at work or as a direct consequence of something that occurred at work. And over 300 million work-related accidents. So translating that to sort of a 15-minute time scale globally, every 15 minutes one person dies at work and another 153 have an accident. So you know, it's occurring very commonly around the world. In Australia, a few years ago, we estimated um, the number of work-related injuries and the number of accepted claims occurring on an annual basis. This is really just for trauma or accidental injury only, not for those occupational diseases and other things that I talked about um, earlier. Um, and we estimated using data from the ABS and our national data set of workers' comp statistics that were there were over half a million injuries in Australia every year, or effectively one per minute and nearly a quarter of a million accepted workers' compensation claims every year. So a lot of people getting injured and making claims for workers' compensation. Um, this is just a slide from a study um, I completed a couple of years ago for ComCare, the National Workers' Compensation Scheme, where we tried to estimate the number of people in Australia during the 15-16 financial year who experienced a period of work disability. So this is not so much about trauma, but it's just about having time off work due to injury or illness. And we were very conservative in our estimates. We still were able to identify looking at all the schemes in Australia that might provide financial support for people with work disability that almost 800,000 people had some period of disability where they were receiving income support from a Commonwealth, state, territory, or a private source. Another six and a half million at a minimum had a period of sick leave where they received sick leave from their employers and the total direct costs just of income support in those two groups was over $37 billion. So that excludes costs like healthcare, treatment, rehabilitation, and it excludes any indirect uh, costs as well. So this is a, a massive issue. Every year in Australia, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of people and billions and billions of dollars being spent on work disability. Another estimate, this was uh, one completed by Safe Work Australia, which is one of our Commonwealth government agencies, estimates that the, the direct and indirect cost just of trauma, traumatic injury, is about 4% of GDP every year, or over $60 billion. Most of that is borne by workers, with some of it borne by uh, employers and the community. This is data from our uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics Work-Related Injury Survey. I'm just showing you this to show you the range of different sources of, of data that we have. Um, this actually demonstrates a, a gradual reduction in people reporting injuries at work between 26, 2006 and 2014. Okay, now I just wanted to cover some common mechanisms of injury, or often called causes of injury. I'll talk about them as mechanisms. This is some data from a study of transport workers, mainly truck drivers, that we just completed with some funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council, where we looked at um, the sort of the immediate underlying cause of injury, what, what occurred to the person when they became injured. And you can see these are things like hitting objects or being hit by objects, falling over, falls and trips and slips, um, body, what's called body stressing, which sort of commonly refers to um, lifting too much uh, musculoskeletal sort of movements, sound and pressure, um, so things that might be you know, loud sounds, um, heat, electricity, other sort of environmental factors, chemical substances, biological substances, mental stress, or motor vehicle incidents or accidents or crashes as we commonly call them. So these are some of the things that we typically see um, as the immediate causes of injury in workplaces. And I'm just showing you transport workers to show you that there's a distribution of those things um, in this particular group. And it's similar to the distributions we see in other groups of workers. So the sort of green bit here is body stressing. We see a lot of musculoskeletal conditions in transport workers. The dark black bit is being hit or hitting objects. So acute injuries you might consider those to be. All slips and trips is the bit in red or pink. And vehicle incidents um, in people who drive for a living account for about 10% of all the injuries that they might have at work. Um, I also wanted to just introduce this concept of what's sometimes been called the causes of the causes or the social determinants of injury. And 
um, you may be familiar with the um, World Health Organization um, approach to this, um, the biopsychosocial model it's sometimes called. There, there is also a workplace specific or work disability specific social determinants model, which talks about the social determinants occurring, occurs, occurring in four domains, those domains being the, what's called the personal system, so that individuals, physical, cognitive, um, affective um, features and their social relationships, so the relationships at home and in the community. Um, the workplace system, so the environment in which the person is working and the nature of the work that they're doing. The healthcare system being um, the healthcare that they're receiving, the nature and quality of that and how it's delivered. And then what's also called the compensation or sometimes the legislative system. So the way support and services are funded and provided by society um, to injured workers. And so this is really a social determinants model where it's quite well accepted in the work disability field. And really uh, it shows that lots of things, lots of factors influence um, the extent to which a person experiences work disability and their ability to return to work and whether they have sort of long-term consequences from a work-related injury or disease. Okay, talking a, bit, a little bit about tools for prevention. Um, conventionally, what we use, the model we use in Australia in our, when we're talking about primary prevention and one that's adopted by a lot of our occupational health and safety agencies is what's called constructive compliance. A simpler term for this would be carrots and sticks. Um, and really the tools that regulators tend to use for prevention can be broken up into what are called encouragement or the carrots, so things like social marketing, education and guidance or financial incentives and you may uh, I assume you're all pretty familiar with uh, the ads on television by WorkSafe uh, and the, the ones about coming home. Uh, and then the, the second set of things here, the sticks or deterrence mechanisms. Um, regulators do have the ability to prosecute employers if they have unsafe working environments and variations on, on, on prosecution, which are perhaps a little bit less dramatic, things like enforceable undertaking, so they can force employers to to fund certain things. They have inspection mechanisms so they can go into workplace, have powers to, to inspect safety practices and policies within work safes. And then new regulations that are, uh, are introduced pretty commonly as well, I'm talking about primary prevention. We're talking about secondary prevention or what I might call what I earlier referred to as stay at work and return to work. Um, we have a similar array of carrots and sticks. They sometimes take different forms. Um, we have other things going on as well. The major other thing being the provision of support and services by government agencies like workers' compensation schemes, the things like health and social care, so paying for health care to help people return to work, um, replacing people's income for periods of time that they can't go to work, um, helping to manage and coordinate the care that's delivered to them and providing sort of specialist occupational rehabilitation. Um, some of the sticks that we see are quite similar to those that we, we see in primary prevention, things like workplace inspection and prosecution and financial disincentives in this case. So you know, employees' insurance premiums can be increased if they experience a lot of injuries in their workplace. And similarly, we see some of the same carrots like ads around returning to work and education and guidance for employers and healthcare providers involved in return to work practice. So there, there are a lot of tools that our regulators use to, to help promote um, the help, sorry, in the primary, secondary and tertiary prevention of work-related disability. And finally, I just wanted to finish with this slide on Australia's very weird and wonderful policy environment when it comes to work disability. Um, it's fair to say at a, at a very high level, we have a, a pretty good degree of consistency between the states and territory when it comes to primary prevention. Most states and territories with a couple of exceptions now use what, what are called the national, nationally harmonized OHS laws. And this is a set of laws that were developed by Safe Work Australia in consultation with the states and territories 10 to 15 years ago. And it effectively standardizes um, the way in which our states and territories deal with primary prevention in workplaces. When it comes to 
return to work and work disability, we have something that's almost at the opposite end of the spectrum. We have a very complex, and very fragmented array of systems that provide support for people once they are injured and ill. Um, so they range from things like sick leave, which is obviously an employer provided entitlement, workers' compensation, which I've spoken about a bit, but also things like life insurance. Um, people can make claims through their life insurance um, for periods of temporary or permanent work disability. That's becoming more common. We have uh, financial support provided through our social security system for people with permanent work disability, like the disability pension, and increasingly like job seeker. Um, in some some parts of society, um, people have people are eligible for other forms of compensation during a period of time they're away from work. So. If you're injured in the Defence Force or you're a veteran, you can potentially access the DBA compensation scheme. And increasingly, also, it's possible for people to withdraw information, for instance, from their superannuation for periods of time if they're permanently disabled or if they have a, a terminal illness. We also even see schemes like motor vehicle crash compensation paying for income support and healthcare for people we were working um, during periods of time when they can't work. So we have this very, very complex array of systems, some of it at the national level, some of it at the state and territory level, some of it is delivered by public entities, a lot of it is delivered by private sector for profit organisations. There's very little standardisation of practices and processes. And to be frank, it's a mess, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. Um, and we really need, um, a bit more policy consistency uh, in this field, in, in my view. So that's about it from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that. I'm happy to take questions. I'll just go back to the first slide so you can see my um, contact details. If you have questions, feel free to get in contact. And I'm looking forward to talking to you uh, when we get a chance um, in a few weeks' time. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.